This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Reed Redmond. I'm Spencer Brudig. I'm Will Johnson. This show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. The callousness of Baby Jane Doe is something that we we, we haven't seen. I've been a policeman for 31 years. I, I've never seen anything like this. Usually you know who your victim is. If you know, that's where you start with the victim and their families and things like that, friends. When you don't know who she is or who your victim is, it's a lot different. Their focus is solely on getting her identified because that's how they believe any homicide investigation can start. February 28th, 1983. Two men venture into an abandoned basement in a St. Louis neighborhood on the north side of town, looking for a pipe to fix their broken down car. And they flicked on a lighter, a uh, cigarette lighter, because obviously there was no electricity in the in the building. It was abandoned. And when what they found that day uh, went on to become one of the most gruesome and coldest cases in St. Louis's history. That's Christine Byers, a crime reporter at KSDK Channel 5 in St. Louis. Christine recently spoke to Major Sean Dace with the St. Louis Police Department about what those two men came across. Uh, she was discovered on February 28, 1983 in Nome. Uh, by two men who went into a uh, vacant apartment complex at 5635 Clemens. Uh, she was located bound in the basement. She was decapitated, wearing only a yellow V-neck sweater. The medical examiners believe she was between the ages of 8 and 12. Um, her hands were tied behind her back with a red and white rope. Um, her nails were actually painted red, um, and they were chipping. You know, it wasn't... Um, it definitely looked like a child had painted her nails. And the most awful detail of this case is that she was decapitated. This case is uh, the only case that we've had to have a child uh, mutilated in this manner, uh, decapitated. So they were not able to use dental records for identification purposes either, and um, her head has never been found. The medical examiner was able to determine that she had been sexually assaulted as well. Usually it's personal when, when somebody decapitates you. Investigators believe someone raped and strangled the little girl. She was naked from the waist down with only that V-neck sweater on. She hadn't been down there too long. Only about three or four days, Green says, based on the mold on the girl's body. Investigators believe someone killed her somewhere else, then dumped her body here in the basement. You had to be from here to know that the building's vacant and you can leave the uh, the child in there and nobody would notice it. Police searched tirelessly for the girl's head, a gruesome task to be sure. Neighbors started to worry their kids would be mutilated next. Keeping a close watch on them and have them in the house before dark. The detective working this murder says the strongest suspect is a St. Louis man named Vernon Brown. He'd been convicted of strangling a woman and a nine-year-old girl within a three-year time span of Jane Doe's murder. So did he strangle Jane Doe too? He never answered any questions from investigators about her, and he never will. Missouri executed Brown in 2005. Recently, on a cold February day, Christine Byers met up with Detective Joe Bergoon with St. Louis County Police visiting the building where he'd been called to the scene almost 40 years ago. Now in his 80s, Bergoon was one of the original investigators on the case. Today, he works part-time on cold cases with St. Louis County Police. So, Joe, you were saying that uh, the weather today just kind of reminds you of that it, day. It was. It, it was colder. But it was colder, you know, because uh, it, it was in the 20s, you know, when we, were, when we were out here. So what do you remember? Well, I remember uh, getting the call. You know, they call the office, they requested homicide, you know, out here. So then we uh, we, we responded. Uh, sergeant Herb Riley, he was deceased now, but he was uh, he was our, he was our sergeant. And when we all got out here, the officers told us and we, we went down and we could look in. We went in the back. You, the front end of the building was boarded up. So we, we were on the back and you could go down in the, in the uh, basement. They had a storage areas. And the first one was a, it was a. Storing things. The second room is where the, where she, the victim, was found, and she was in a uh, the furnace room. You know, it was real dark in there, and uh, it was damp, cold, and damp. You know, and we saw the saw the victim laying there. She was laying face down, and her, all she had on was a yellow V-neck sweater, and her hands were tied behind her back, with you know, a red and white nylon rope. What were your initial thoughts about the the chances of solving the case? Well, we thought we had a good. We figured you figured it was it had to be a, somebody reported missing. Right away, so we thought we'd start when we, when we uh, after the, we did the, the crime scene and the canvassing, we went back to the office and we started start checking on missing persons, calling around and everything, you know, and uh, we didn't come up with anything. No one was reported missing uh, a child. We didn't know she was really a child until they turned her over, you know. We thought she was a woman, you know. So you guys thought you would have an answer right away? We thought, well, we thought we did, you know, but it... Uh, uh, that was very rare in those days to have something like this. You know, usually uh, uh, we can get fingerprints. We can the, off the identification section would check the prints right away. You know, but we didn't have all this automation that they have now. You know, it had to be hand searchers, so it takes a while to search search through all those. You know, there was an exhaustive investigation that went on in the early days. Um, you know, the homicide detectives that were around then they went through every St. Louis City public school district uh, student was accounted for that year, um, and just all the missing children's reports in the area. So you just thought that 
this being a child, there would be a missing children's report. Absolutely. Then we start checking the schools, you know, checking the schools in the neighborhood, going to the public school system, and they were very good. They had computers, and we were checking different schools, any children withdrawn or transferred. You know, we were working with juvenile officers then, and then uh, uh, our our, our, our captain was uh, Captain Leroy Atkins, and he was really involved in this, and he really, uh, really, really got to him a child like this. And he he was going to meetings all the time, the, the community meetings, trying and contacting the media. <coughs> we also uh, contacted every state police agency in the United States for any missing children fit the description of her. You know, people were scared. I talked to people at. Uh, the, that remember this case because they were going to school then too, you know, and they said, yeah, we were we were really scared in that time frame, you know. But people were grateful. You know, we'd go door to door if we had to, and when we have a name or something like that, and check to check to see if uh, does so and so live here? Yes, can we see her? You know, and they'd bring her out and show us show us to her, and uh, and I mean, people would say, thank you very much for what you're doing, you know. You know, the officer detectives and that you don't hear that anymore. Like they were very appreciative, you know. They weren't uh, they wanted to find this person, whoever was responsible, you know. To, to ease their minds in the community because they were scared with their kids. They were, the parents were waiting at the bus stops with their children. The most perplexing part of this case is the fact that no one has ever declared this girl missing. And that has been the biggest mystery here is who is she? Um, and, and that's been, you know, the, the the hardest part of investigating this case is without knowing who your victim is, you really can't start a homicide investigation. Do you believe that she was killed in that building? No. No, she was, she was brought in there. Because you know, her body was drained and there was uh, blood, and there wasn't any apparently not not much blood. It was it was it was from draining out, you know. Yeah, definitely. So you would have expected to find a much bloodier scene. Oh, absolutely, that's... absolutely. And this this was a this was a brutal crime. You don't know what you know you don't know what she went through, you know. Before you know, she hadn't, we know she hadn't eaten. <laughs> you know, there's no when the medical examiner's office did their autopsy and uh, you check for there's, there wasn't any food in her stomach. You know, so, so no stomach food stomach contents. So you know she hadn't been eating. And they, they figured that, uh, you know, the, uh, there was some mold growing on, on the injuries on the neck and there was skin slippage. So the medical examiner's office contacted the Missouri Botanical Gardens and they were able to, to grow a, a mold similar to the mold that was on the body. And it took four to five days to grow. So we figured that she was probably there four to five days. And they said, this is a kind of mold that grows in a uh, cold, dark, damp place. And that's what that base is like mushrooms growing in a cave. And they said, this is what, this is what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. So she knows she'd have been in there four to five days. But still, no one came forward to say who the girl could be. And later that year, in December, the little girl was buried. And the case went cold until decades later. Right around 2012, 2013, uh, they wanted to exhume her remains because with DNA testing, you know, um, it's been explained to me that basically once they do DNA testing um, on certain samples and that sort of thing, those samples can't be used again. And so they were hoping to get more DNA from her remains. And at the time of her murder, she was buried... Um, in a pauper's grave, basically, in a cemetery on um, in, in North St. Louis County. And over the years, that cemetery ended up um, in all kinds of mismanagement and became overgrown and just, you know, uh, completely in ruins, basically. And so um, when they went to exhume her, it turned out that her body and her remains were not buried under her grave marker. And there were no records to really show where exactly she was buried. But that wasn't the end of it. A team of researchers from Washington University in St. Louis heard about the case of the little girl. And so what they were able to do um, was take photographs that the newspaper had of the actual burial ceremony and, and use those photographs and the trees specifically in those photographs to pinpoint the exact location of where she was actually buried. So they were able to exhume her remains and get fresh DNA samples. And still, even with DNA, the testing was inconclusive. Basically, they were able to do some mineral testing on her bones, and that showed that she spent the majority of her life in the southeastern portion of the country, about 11 states it narrowed it down to. The test revealed Jane Doe spent most, if not all, of her life in these 11 states. Texas, Tennessee, Louisiana, Arkansas, Georgia, North or South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, or Indiana. You know, down there in that area, and that's pretty big. Desperate for answers, police even sent the bloody sweater Jane Doe was wearing and the nylon rope to a psychic in Florida. But it didn't help. The little girl was buried for a second time at Calvary Cemetery at the Garden of Innocence. My help uh, actually got the honor to push her casket in and out of the mausoleum that day. We didn't know her story, but I can tell the end of the life story, the story I know. Outside of that, the identity of the girl, now known by many around St. Louis as Baby Jane Doe, or Precious Hope, remained a mystery. 
Still, investigators haven't forgotten the little girl. In 2019, the St. Louis Police Department formed a cold case unit, and this case is one of their top priorities. And certainly when we hear about breaks in, you know, decades-old cold cases and Jane Doe's and John Doe's, it, it makes you think, well, why won't that work for this case? And, you know, one of the homicide detectives that I've talked to um, has said, you know, these, these systems, these DNA databases and that, they're only as good as the information that's in them. And for little Jane Doe here in St. Louis, it, it seems like so far the correct family member just has not shown up in any of these databases. Homicide cases are not, you know, cookie cutter cases. It, 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 you know, it takes breaks here. It takes cooperation from the community. It takes, uh, it takes a, a, a variety of things to solve cases. Um, you know, nobody's more frustrated than we are uh, about this. Um, we, you know, we, we, we're really, really trying uh, our best to identify this young lady um, before we can, you know, we can even move further in the, in the case. So somebody out there knows something. And we hope that, um, you know, airing this and, 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 uh, with the help of folks like you and getting this out here, that it'll spark and it'll spur somebody to do the right thing and say what they know. What investigators are really hoping for now at this point is that someone uh, somewhere will enter their DNA into these private databases that um, are leading to so many breaks in cold cases like 23andMe, GenMatch, Ancestry.com. You know, those are places that people are going to and, and submitting their DNA to trace their heritage, to trace their roots. But it's also leading to these breaks in these cases. It's just a matter of time before somebody, you know, is able to enter their DNA in, in one of those databases and they get a match. In the meantime, police continue to hang on to the hope that someone might remember something from almost four decades ago. But what I'm hoping, though, is that somebody remembers something that they may not have thought was um, was important at the time um, and and decide to contact us. That's what we're hoping for. They've actually been able to rule out uh, 20 missing children that are in the database since the formation of the cold case unit as well back in 2019. So they're definitely, you know, actively looking and actively comparing what they have. Um, but, I mean, there's just almost virtually no stone uncovered when it comes to trying to identify this little girl and, and using the resources that police have available to them now. As far as what you remember seeing that day, um, all this time later, um, it seems like it's really stayed with you. Oh, it does. It does. Children and... Um Children and elderly people, you know, because they're, they're they're helpless people. They can't they can't defend defend themselves, you know. So that makes a difference too, you know. And then the way that the way, the way some of these cases turn out is very vicious, you know. Somebody knows something somewhere. This little girl was a part of somebody's life and just vanished. And so anybody with any question of any relative or friend they ever had, it doesn't matter how small the tip is. Any tip could prove to be crucial in this case. Well, sooner or later, you know, there's a lot. Of, it's it's still ongoing. And there's still detectives are still working on it. You know, it's just uh, uh, someday we're going to find out who she is. The slightest information we may receive from the public may break the case. So we're hoping that any and everything that we have and, and that we're trying to do right now will help us uh, figure out who this young lady is. Locally here in St. Louis for this case, anybody with information, even the slightest thing, like, you know, I remember sitting next to this little girl in class. Where did she ever go? Or I don't know whatever happened to her. Um, they're asking people to call the local chapter of Crime Stoppers, which is 866-371-TIPS. Uh, we, we still believe that we're going to identify this young lady and solve this case. She had a life, and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer. And it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Pune Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Korsland. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is The Yellow Car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. All right, Will Johnson here, along with Spencer Brudig and Reed Redmond. Guys, you know, a, a really horrible, sad story without an answer at this point. You know, the, the the cold case unit, as we talk about, is is investigating this actively and hoping to get some answers. Yeah, and usually with the cases we cover, the thing we don't know is who did it, who the killer was. But in this one, they're still working to figure out who the victim was. Well, early on in the episode, you brought up that there was one suspect, it sounded like, or a person of interest earlier on in the investigation. Whatever happened to that, I assume it, it didn't pan out. Yeah, just to clarify and close the loop on that, it, that was from a news report. And that one suspect that they considered, who I believe died in prison, he was cleared. So uh, they, they're confident that he was not responsible for for this murder. Yeah, and I, I think one of the most interesting parts of this case is the actual interview with Joe Bergoon, the detective. Uh, it's to, to hear someone that is so knowledgeable about something and then he's able to kind of relay the behind the scenes information of what their thought process was is so interesting. Uh, it, it was really, really cool to hear um, his take on this case. Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly valuable to have someone who was there at the very beginning investigating this with the cold case unit today, still investigating it. And, you know, I, I mean, it goes without saying, maybe it's obvious, but 
as years and decades go by, those people will not be around anymore. And so, you know, being able to solve this sooner than later seems really important with the original folks who were involved. Well, I, w- I wanted to bring us back to the people who happened to be in this basement and discovered the body. Do we know, were they ever looked at as persons of interest or, or did their, their story, it sounds like, did check out? Yeah, I know it's really interesting. And I think that's the first thing that people wonder about when they hear the story, two guys who go into an abandoned basement and happen to make this discovery. It all seems kind of weird. But as far as we know, from uh, Detective Burgoon to you know news reports, from everything we've heard, uh, they were cleared and they were cleared early on. I don't know if they were actually labeled even a person's of interest. I think they called police and reported it and um, were you know, cleared, as I say. Spencer, I know you've looked into this a little bit, uh, and, and there were a couple of pieces of evidence really from this crime that the rope that was used to tie her hands, also the yellow sweater. What happened to that yellow sweater? Well, reportedly, with the yellow sweater at least, um, after forensic analysis had kind of found out everything that they could from it, they actually had sent it to a psychic. Um, not exactly sure why that was, but it was lost in the mail. So um, unfortunately, they no longer have access to that piece of evidence. Well, I was also interested in the mineral testing that you mentioned after they exhumed Jane Doe's body. And it, it sounds like it showed where this girl was likely from or had spent a portion of her life, even though we, we still, of course, don't know much else about her. And with that testing showing potentially that she wasn't from the St. Louis area, it seems like maybe that could explain her not being a match for any local missing persons cases anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. It would seem to make sense. And, you know, another thing about that whole process of exhuming her body, which I think is just kind of interesting, is that it points to how big a case this is uh, that you know, this horrific discovery was made. And then decades later, they, you know, have to go through quite a big effort to locate her and then uh, get her body again or, you know, the remains um, and do some testing. But, you know, it it, it speaks to how important it is uh, for investigators to try to solve this. All right, Spencer, uh, new members joining our Facebook group every single week. Uh, We probably don't even need to mention it, but let's do it for our new new listeners. Yeah, we are closing in on 6,000 members on our Facebook group called Inside the Crime Vault. So we hope to see you all um, in the digital space. All right, thanks to Spencer Brudig and Reed Redman for True Crime Chronicles. I'm Will Johnson. We'll be back next week with a new case and a new story.